Welcome everyone to this webinar on PAD, Peripheral Artery Disease. Um, to, to start this webinar, we will have a presentation by uh, Andrian uh, Michaud, who's going to present uh, the guide in general. And then we will have a specific presentation uh, on PAD, more specifically PAD and physical activity uh, with um, Laurence Labrec. Uh, who's going to present how physical activity can improve um, PAD. Hi, my name is Andréanne Michaud and uh, I'm a nutritionist but also an assistant professor at the School of Nutrition at l'Université Laval. I'm also at, uh, a researcher at uh, the Institut Universitaire de Cardiologie de Primology de Québec and I'm a member of the Canadian Foundation for Vascular Health. So today, uh, I will briefly introduce uh, the practical guide about peripheral artery disease. And uh, following my introduction, Laurence Labrec, uh, which is a clinicologist and a PhD candidate at Laval University, will talk about peripheral artery disease and physical activity. And we will have um, a period for, uh, to answer some questions. Uh, so a quick word about Canadian Foundation for Vascular Health. It was founded in the fall 2014, and in 2017, uh, the foundation obtained its status as a charitable organization with the goal of supporting patients who are at uh, risk of developing or who have uh, peripheral artery disease. What is peripheral artery disease? Very briefly, it's a condition affecting nearly um, 2 million uh, Canadians aged over 50. And peripheral artery disease is the name uh, for the narrowing of the peripheral blood vessel, more specifically the arteries, that causes symptoms for patients. So symptoms will vary depending on the location, but also the severity of the disease. And one of the main symptoms is the intermittent claudication, um, as you can see here on this figure, which is associated with pain and difficulty to walk. Unfortunately, um, there's a significant proportion of individuals with this disease that do not experience any symptoms and do not know that they have it yet. Uh, however, the, uh, the consequences of this disease are very serious because patients with peripheral artery disease are at high risk of developing heart disease or having a stroke. So it's important to learn about this disease and to uh, recognize this disease and uh, to prevent its consequences. So our first um, goal with the foundation was to develop a practical guide about peripheral artery disease to help individuals with this disease to better understand their disease. So how it is uh, developed, its consequences on their quality of life and how to prevent and treat it. Uh, so this work was done under the supervision of Dr. Jean-Pascal Costa, Geneviève David, Dr. Gabriel Huard, Laurence Labrec, and myself. And the concept, the conception was developed in collaboration with Gabriel Dumouchel. And the graphic design and illustration um, were entirely done by Christian saint -Ange. So the guide includes eight sections that have been written uh, by experts in their field. So section one is about what is peripheral artery disease. Section two, what is happening in my leg? So it's about the physiopathology of the disease. Uh, section three, explain what are the risk factors for peripheral artery disease. Section four, you have uh, all is peripheral artery disease diagnosed. Section five is about the quality of life. So uh, will peripheral artery disease affect my daily life? Section six describes uh, the treatment. Section seven describes the importance uh, of physical activity. And Laurence Labrec uh, will present after me 
uh, as participate to as as participate in the writing of this, this section. And section eight uh, explain the tools that can help uh, individual with. Uh, so what I like the most uh, with this uh, practical guide uh, about um, peripheral artery disease are the illustrations developed uh, by Christine and also. Here I put some example. You have uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, on figure two, uh, you can see an obstruction of an artery, uh, a peripheral artery. Uh, figure uh, four shows uh, the main risk factor for uh, disease, so smoking, diabetes, age, hypertension, obesity. It's really easy um, to uh, interpret this, this figure. Um, you also have on figure five, the ankle brachial index, which is uh, a measurement used for the diagnostic of peripheral artery disease. So it could be a, a concept a bit uh, hard to understand when you read it, but when you have uh, the illustration to, it's, it's much easier to understand it. Uh, what I also like is that in each sec section of the guide, there's a summary with the key messages that are explained by Tim, that you can see here. So if you don't have time to read all the sections, you can just read uh, the summary that are in red square explained by Tim. Uh, and what I like is that uh, this guide uh, was uh, based on scientific references. Um, so uh, it's also based on professional practice. Uh, so I think it's very important that it has been based on uh, the science. Uh, so just before uh, I leave um, uh, the, I leave the, the presentation to uh, Laurence. I just want to acknowledge all the people that were involved um, in this work, so all the writers, uh, people um, involved in the supervision, the concept and graphic design and illustration, all the review, reviewers uh, that gave us uh, very good feedback and uh, the funding. So thank you for your attention and um, I will leave uh, Laurence uh, Labrec to speak about uh, the, the importance of physical activity um, with peripheral artery disease. All right, so thank you, Andréanne. I'll be presenting the section seven and eight of the guide, which are the last two, and they concern the treatment of PAD with exercise. But first, I'll present myself. So I am Laurence Lamrec. I'm a doctoral candidate at Université Laval, and more specifically, I work at the Research Center of the Institut Universitaire de Cardiologie et de Pneumologie Québec. So I have a training in kinesiology, which, which makes me a specialist in physical activity. So throughout the presentation, I'll be speaking about PAD, which refers to peripheral artery disease, and physical activity. So there are multiple approaches to treat PADS, such as medication to control risk factors or surgery. However, the one that's most effective and cost efficient is exercise. So in addition to improving um, leg pain symptoms, it increases the quality of life. It also prevents and treat the risk factors and it reduces the mortality. So exercise plays a role in treating that, but also to the improvement of many spheres of human health. We also know that a sedentary lifestyle is the risk factor we can most easily modify. So just by standing up and moving a little, you are having an impact on your global health. So more specifically, the benefits of exercise are numerous. So in the context of PAD, it increases the walking distance, it also has an impact on the, of, on the time of, of walking without pain and maximal walking time. It has favorable effects on risk factors, so whether it's obesity, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and cholesterol. It has beneficial effects on, of, on aging, so for example, it could have, it has impacts on um, muscular strength. It also has beneficial effects on cognition. So people who are training usually have a better memory. They have better executive functions. And it gives a cardiovascular prevention. So as Andréanne said, 
um, pad is associated with, for example, a greater risk to do strokes or to suffer from heart failure. So um, in addition to all these benefits, it gives prevention for other diseases. So as I said, walking is the most recognized treatment for PAD. And although it's the most recommended type of physical activity, other types are effective. So for instance, cycling can also be an alternative and is associated with advantages. So whether it's a regular bike, a stationary bike, or even a harm bike, you can use cycling as a way to benefit from exercising. So it also increases walking distance and the cycle distance, of course. It improves exercise tolerance, it improves muscular strength, and it's associated with a greater level of security, particularly for people who have trouble with balance. So cycling can be interesting for people who are at risk for of falling or during the winter if there is ice outside. So it can be more interesting to train inside, for example. There's also a type of training that is gaining popularity and it's called HIT or high intensity interval training. Speaking of high intensity might seem a bit extreme in this case, but let me explain um, what stage of intensity is associated with. So when we are speaking, for example, of low intensity, so that corresponds to a level of exercise where you can talk and you're not really feeling your exercise, exercising, but you're not at rest. Moderate intensity is when you start having trouble to speak easily. So you have a small shortness of breath and you feel that you are warming up a little. High intensity is when you cannot really talk. You have a shortness of breath while you are exercising. So that would be, you could not um, support this intensity very long. So when we are regarding hit training, so here you have at the bottom left, an example of graph that depicts an exercise that is done continuously at a moderate intensity. So that's, for example, I go for a light walk for 20 minutes, for example. However, these type of exercises are sometimes associated with um, discouraging and it's not really motivating when you know you have to train for like half an hour. So HIP can be a solution to that. So instead of going continuously for multiple minutes, we can increase the intensity of exercise and interspace it with resting periods, either they are active or passive. So for example, here we have a small bout of high intensity exercise that is interspaced with a small, a short period of rest, whether it's seated rest, where we just stop uh, doing exercise, or you, if, for example, if you're walking, you are taking a very light walk for that specific period. So HIT is the training where you repeat these um, sequences. So what is interesting with it is that there are evidences it gives similar and even superior effects than continuous exercise. And that's for a shorter, shorter exercise time. So it has beneficial impacts on um, motivation and adhesion. So since it's shorter, it's more variable as a type of training, people usually like it more. It's associated with an increase in walking distance. And I remember you, it's for a shorter time of exercise, which is really interesting. It's associated with a, an improvement of daily living activities. So if you feel better, you are more in a state where you can do your things and an improvement of physical condition. However, there's a very important thing to do before going into it, it or even changing your exercising a bit, and is to get a medical advice because there are conditions where in increasing the intensity of, ex of your exercise could not be beneficial or make you at risk of having serious uh, problems. So here's the medical advice. So globally, the take home message is that moving should be part of your daily living. I spoke about walking and cycling, but all the sports are good. In fact, so whether you play golf, you're dancing, uh, you play bowling, anything, it's good. Of course, as I said, you need to get a medical advice before changing your exercising habits. And overall, there are uh, small tips to make your training um, 
better. So of course, um, you have to go often. So it's recommended to do three to five times a week um, to exercise. Ideally, we have to make um, 30 to 60 minutes of exercising. So each time you go for an exercise, it could, it could be to 30 to 60, 60 minutes. So it might seem a lot, but for example, if I go for 30 minutes during a day, I could go, I could separate it by 20 minutes, 10 minutes and 10 minutes. So I go for a longer walk in the morning. I, of 20 minutes, I do a small walk during the lunchtime of 10 minutes. And at night I cycle while I watch my favorite channel, for example. So you have your 40 minutes during your day. And you have to do that three to five times a week. And ideally, of course, in the COVID-19 context, it's not easy, but it has to be supervised. So someone, a kinesiologist, for instance, is there to help you answer your question, um, go through that, your process with you. And as I, of course, if you'd like to do moderate or higher intensity, you have to warm up before. So um, example, if you go out for a walk, start slower, and then you can increase your speed. Finally, there's a great diversity of devices and tools that can be used to maintain an active lifestyle. The interesting thing with devices is that they provide um, speed and resistance control. So when we're speaking about stationary devices. So first of all, um, you can use them either at home or in a gym. So you can use devices such as a treadmill, which can be hard for people who have balance problem because it's harder to walk on a treadmill than to walk on a floor. <laughs> um, you can also use a stationary bike, which is very interesting because it does not take that much space into a house, for example. And it's usually associated with a, a large and travel of speeds and difficulties. And it's also um, something you can do while doing anything else. Either it's while reading, while watching TV. Um, there's also an, a device that it's more and more common in stores and it's the arm bike. So usually it's a small uh, cycling device that you can either put on the table to cycle with your arm or you can put it on the floor to cycle with your legs. So it's a very interesting um, device. And finally, you have elliptical trainers and stairs. But what you have to know is that usually they take a lot of space and uh, they are associated with a greater baseline intensity. So usually... Um, they are not preferred with, by patients who are suffering from PAD. So of course your choice will be based on different aspects such as your budget, the space you have, the sport you prefer, the, the, the activities you prefer to do, and the stage of PAD you're at. So there are also the tracking tools that are interesting to, um, to track your active lifestyle. So first of all, there is the potometer which um, is a device that calculates your steps. Um, of course, try to buy one that is um, pretty accurate. So what you can do is that you put it on your belt and then you walk, let's say you count the number of steps you do. So let's see 30 just to try it. And the, the Peter meter would have to be between 29 and 31 steps. If you calculated 30, it should not differ from one or maximum two steps. So if it differs more, um, the, the, the error is too large. You can also use, also use smart devices such as a tablet or a phones. There are multiple apps to track your activity. Um, however, be careful with um, the apps because sometimes they give objectives without um, considering your age, your actual conditions. So, um, use them to track, but not necessarily to um, follow the objectives they're giving you. And finally, you can use watches or wrist devices. And depending on the type you buy, they count several things such as daily calories, number of steps, the distant walk. So they're very interesting to, um, to track, again, your physical activity. So one of the principal mechanisms is when you reach the stage of pain in leg while walking. 
So uh, the muscles send an alarm signals and tell the body that they're lacking oxygen, oxygen, because we know that in pad, blood vessels are blocked in the legs. So the alarm, our muscle pain, is actually driving a cascade of other physiological signals, which will ultimately lead to the creation of new vessels. As an example, it's like if there was a traffic jam on the highway and we would take the small roads to, the small roads to get around instead. So it's why the it's with sorry these new small rows that the blood flow to the muscle is improved in the end. So that's a very good question. Let's take the Peter meter as an example or any other device that calculates steps. What I would propose is to wear the device during a few normal days without changing your exercising habits and to note the number of steps done. And then you could take the average of steps in a normal day as a reference and then to increase it. Generally, we aim at, at increasing the number to 500 or 1,000 more steps per day. However, this objective can be high at first and you could start by a lower objective, let's say 250, for example. And then you could readjust the number of steps each week, each week or each 10 days. The very important thing is to always move forward in your objectives and to make them realistic. It would be super to have a goal of increasing the number to 2000, but if you don't reach it and get discouraged, it isn't better. It really much depends on what we do in a day. Someone using his or her car work and working in an office won't make as much steps as someone who walks to go to work and has an active job. The guideline recommendation is to walk 10,000 steps per day, but that's a pretty high number if you do not have an active lifestyle. So I think that it's important to set goals that are proportional to the baseline number of steps. So I would use the strategy where I told you to calculate this type, the steps during a normal day, and then to increase um, to a number that is realistic for you. In fact, it really much depends on the stage of the disease. Someone who is at a lower stage will be able to walk at various speeds without leg pain. Conversely, a patient who is at a more advanced level can rapidly have symptoms in the, and in fact does hit by repeating cycles of walking small distances and resting and then repeating this. So intensity is relative on the person's physical condition. Also, HIT can be done in harder sports than walking. As an example, cycling could cause less symptoms to someone since, since it's more in the tights that are recruited compared to calves during walking. Ultimately, high intensity corresponds to the level of exercise that will bring the patient to leg pain, to the pain in his legs. And I, and I remind you that it's important to get a medical advice before changing your habits or increasing the intensity of your training, of course. 